Their plan was to knock me out the top of the game But I overstand their truth is all lame I hold cannons that shoot balls of flame Right in their fat mouth then I call my name Hi, I'm Yuha and I'm a hockey player here at USC I will be going through some first concepts and examples with you this semester And remember, just like on the ice, there's no such thing as luck in physics Just keep your head up and work hard The reason why celestial bodies move the way they do had puzzled people since the early ages. A Danish astronomer called Tycho Brahe was the first one to collect extensive amount of data about their positions as a function of time. And uh, after studying that material, his apprentice Johannes Kepler came up with the following observations that are known as the Kepler's laws. He claimed that, number one, each planet moves in an elliptical orbit with the sun at the focus of the ellipse. So here we have the planet going around the sun. So there's the other focus and the other focus is somewhere around here symmetrically. It's just a point in empty space. And uh, second, a line from the sun to a given planet, so for example, we have a line going from, he, from the sun to the planet, uh, sweeps out equal areas in equal times. So in the same time, let's say uh, some delta t, this line sweeps the area shown in blue a when it's at this end of the ellipse. And the same area is swept in the same amount of time any given point in the ellipse, for example, at the other end. And uh, because the planet is closer to the sun here, to cover the same area, it's, it must move faster. And this is what happens, and this in fact follows from the uh, conservation of uh, momentum, which uh, wasn't really known at that time, at time yet in the early 1600s. And third, Kepler claimed that the periods of the planets are proportional to the 3 over 2 powers of the major axis lengths of their orbits. So the major axis is just the, the length of the ellipse. In orbital mechanics it's called as A. And he was saying that the time it takes to complete one orbit is proportional to that uh, length to the power of 3 over 2. This can, of course, be written as follows. That's three. And uh, maybe it was the second power here that made several people believe in the late 1600s that the gravitational force that was suspected to keep the planets moving was, in fact, inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the sun. So this is the inverse square law that we have already discussed. And one of those people was astronomer Edmund Halley, uh, after whom one of the more famous comets have been named after. And in fact in 1684 he walked into Isaac Newton's office when he was a professor and asked Newton the question what if gravity in fact is proportional to the inverse of the square of the distance, what would be the trajectory of the object around the sun in that case? And uh, Newton immediately answered, it would be an ellipse. Understandably, Halley's jaw dropped and uh, after he had recovered, he asked, how did you know that? And Newton said, I calculated it. So, in fact, he had come up with this theory of gravity, mm times g divided by r squared, and had also solved the trajectory of the planets if they obeyed this law and hadn't told anyone about it. Just like he had invented calculus and didn't tell anyone about it in 27 years. So, uh, eventually, 
Edmund Halley was able to convince Newton to publish his results and uh, Newton retired from all the other activities for two years and he published his famous book Philosophia Naturalis Principalia Mathematica also known as the Principia in short and uh, the drama in fact wasn't over quite yet so he published his work in three volumes and uh, one, once the two of them were out he had fallen into a debate with a German mathematician Leibniz about uh, who invented the calculus so the 27 years that Newton had waited without telling about it for anyone Leibniz just came to the same conclusion and uh, because of that rift Newton refused to publish the third volume without which the first two didn't make much sense. With a considerable amount of begging, Newton finally agreed to cooperate. But the problem was that the Royal Society a year before had published a book called History of Fishes. It had been a massive financial flop and they were thinking that a book about mathematical theory would be another disaster. So in the end, Halley ended up paying the public uh, the publishing of Principia from his own pocket and uh, he got uh, compensated by the Royal Society in the copies of History of the Fishes. Anyway, now the word about Newton's revolutionary work finally got out. In his work, Newton was able to show that if a body moves under the influence of a force that is uh, universally proportional to the distance from the body, the trajectory would be one of the conic sections. Conic sections are obtained when the one starts slicing the cone in different ways. So if we cut horizontally, the cross section is going to be a circle. If we go at an angle, we get an ellipse. If we go an angle that is parallel to the side of the cone, we get a parabola. And finally, if we go vertically, we get hyperbola. And here you can see all these different trajectories when object is orbiting a central body. So circle, ellipse, those are the closed orbits, and then we have the open orbits, parabola and hyperbola, for which the satellite is not bound to the gravitational pull of the central body, but is merely passing by or escaping the central body. From this result, we can understand the motion of objects on the surface of the Earth and also around it. So like in this figure, let's imagine we are on top of a tower and we throw a ball down. We have learned so far that the trajectory of the object would be a parabola, but in fact that is not true. If the object was able to continue all the way to the earth, it would follow an ellipse and in such a way that the center of the earth would be in one of the foci, like here. And if there was a suitable hole dug around the or in the earth, it would come all the way down and hit us in the head. And uh, if we keep throwing the ball at higher velocities, it will, of course, fly further away and land somewhere further down range. But if we throw fast enough, as it's going on this elliptical orbit, it may never hit the Earth necessarily. And that is when we call that the object is on orbit around the Earth. So the number four here is in fact a circular orbit that a lot of the satellites use. And the number five is a slightly larger orbit. Six would be the parabola where we have enough velocity so that the object never returns to Earth and it escapes the uh, orbital or the gravitational pull of the Earth. So this would correspond to the uh, escape velocity that we calculated in the previous video. And seven would be a hyperbolic trajectory which uh, escapes the Earth 
even faster. The analysis of most of these orbits is uh, beyond the scope of this course, but uh, by using simple Newtonian mechanics we can analyze the circular orbit that we had here, for example. So Newton's second law says that the sum of the forces, so in this case we would only have a gravitational force at some distance from the center of the Earth equals mass times acceleration. And uh, as you remember, if we are on a circular trajectory, then we have ormo only normal acceleration towards the center of the Earth, of which magnitude is v squared over r. So the velocity on a circular orbit is constant. So we have m times a, a being v squared over r. And now if we cancel some stuff, so r's go away, the masses go away, we can solve for the circular velocity to be just the square root of capital G Me divided by r. And typically for satellites around the Earth they're about uh, uh, 8 to 9 kilometers per second, just to give you an idea. So that is the velocity that the rockets that launch those satellites have to achieve going sideways. So when you're launching a rocket, first you go up to escape the atmosphere that doesn't slow you down, and then you turn sideways and accelerate to a velocity that is enough to keep the object from hitting the Earth so that the satellite ends up on an orbit around the Earth. And also from this result we can calculate the time it takes to complete one such orbit because the velocity is constant. The time it takes to complete one orbit around the Earth is just the length of the orbit, so 2 pi times r, the uh, circumference of a circle, divided by the velocity. And we know the velocity, we just calculated, so g times mass of the Earth divided by r, and uh, let's uh, simplify this a little bit, so we get uh, big square root like this. So this r becomes second power, or that's r becomes second power when you bring it in. Then we have the other r from below, like this, and g times me. And if you take the r's out, we in fact get r to the power of 3 over 2 times g me. And uh, we can compare this result to those of the Keplers. So, okay, we have to make a correction here. So that is in fact 2a. So the semi-major axis is just the uh, half of the length of the ellipse. And uh, for a circular orbit, this a is same as the radius of the orbit. So here we see r to the uh, 3 over 2 power is uh, the same that Kepler was able to deduce from his mentor's observations. And in fact, in his famous work, Newton was able to derive all the Kepler's laws from his universal law of gravitation. The Principia sold much better than the history of fishes and uh, immediately made Newton a famous person. In the scientific world. Oh, 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 oh 56, no, nigga, shut hey, the fuck up. That Dutch, fuck that nigga, nah, run, run that back. Fucking money. Run that back. What? Yeah, I got to get out, man. You got to run that back. Run it back? All right, run it back.